so grateful that you could all be here. I'm sorry that we can't make the room bigger, but it will be filled with wonderful ideas, and we're so grateful for everyone's company. My name is Jordana Mendelssohn. I'm Associate Professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and Director of the KJCC. Along with Associate Director Laura Turegano, we welcome all of you to this evening's program, What Does Reenchanting the World Mean Today? A conversation between Veronica Gago and Silvia Federici. Tonight's event marks the first in Veronica Gago's series of public programs as this year's Andres Bello Chair. We celebrate this launch along with the return of our Bello Chair after an almost three-year hiatus because of the pandemic. We couldn't be more pleased to have this position occupied by Veronica, and we could not celebrate it in a better way than having Silvia Federici join us in tonight's launch. We thank Gabriel Giorgi, who unfortunately cannot be here. He's in Buenos Aires. <laughs> but he's joining us in spirit, as he was the faculty member who brought Veronica's nomination to the KJCC. As you all know, Veronica Gago teaches political science at the University of Buenos Aires and is professor of sociology at the Instituto de Altos Estudios, Universidad Nacional de San Martín. As a researcher at the National Council of Research, she is also part of the group for feminist research and intervention. Her publications include Neoliberalism from Below, Popular Pragmatics and Baroque Economies, Feminist International, and she is co-author of A Feminist Reading of Debt with Lucy Caballero. She is a member of the independent radical collective press, Tinta Limon. <clears throat> Along with her public programs, which you can find listed in this flyer, there are more outside and online. Af Along with her public programs, which include a two-day taller on March 30th and 31st, and a final conversation with Susanna Draper on April 20th, we thank her for the truly inspiring graduate seminar she has been leading this semester on Prácticas Feministas, Tiempos y Territorios de la Revuelta. While tonight we share in a public-facing conversation, know that the walls of the center are also reverberating daily, weekly, hourly, by the minute, with the energy, advocacy, and intelligence of Veronica's truly collaborative, pedagogical, and revolutionary thinking. Gago shares with us this evening a member, a prominent member of her feminist network, her ongoing conversations with Silvia Ferrici, who summarized the impact of Gago's book, Feminist International, by writing quite succinctly and definitively, it opens new worlds and calls for action. Opening and calling an invitation to dialogue is exactly what Veronica has already been doing since her arrival at NYU. Silvia Federici, as we all know, is an Italo American writer, activist, and professor emerita of political philosophy at Hofstra University nearby. In 1972, she co founded the International Feminist Collective, which launched the international campaign Wages for Housework. She's the author of numerous books about political philosophy, feminist theory, and economy, such as Caliban and the Witch, Women, the Body, and Primitive Accumulation, and Revolution at Point Zero. As always, we thank you all for being here, and we thank our partners in bringing Veronica's activities to campus, including the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Sin más, os presento a Silvia y a Veronica. Gracias. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. I love that this very packed. Um, I'm deeply honored to be here to host this event. Um, and I want to thank Jordana Mendelssohn, Laura Turegano, and also Gabriel Giorgi uh, for inviting me. And of course, uh, I am completely humbled to be here with Silvia, my friend. Uh, Sylvia doesn't need further introduction, but I would like to, to start by, by telling you that I met Sylvia for the first time in 2009 uh, on my first visit here to, in New York. We met to discuss the details of the plan of translation of Caliban and the Witch into Spanish um, to be published in Tinta Limón, our militant publishing house in Argentina. The book uh, was translated by our mutual friend, Sebastián Tousa. Sebastián passed away from COVID, uh, and we would like to honor his memory today. 
the, that talk that we, we had with Silvia later became the introduction to the first edition of Caliban and the Witch, and since then we have been friends in conversation. Needless to say that the book has been a precious gift for feminists uh, worldwide. Silvia shares a method, a historical understanding, and a political orientation. We have followed the river of her thinking in her different works, and I am convinced that this flow is a key element of the current feminist movement in different geographies. For feminist practices in Argentina and in Latin America, especially for these years of active struggles against violence and exploitation, Silvia has been a strategic interlocutor. I am deeply grateful for this opportunity to have this public conversation, thinking aloud over the burning question of how to re-enchant the world. A very challenging time as we hear all around loud screaming about catastrophe, depression and impotence, translated into philosophies of political retreat. To talk about re-enchantment of the war is not a naive proposal. Rather, it involves the closest, most accurate readings of the contemporary forms of patriarchal, racist, capitalist violence. We are also talking about, in the midst of an enormous unfolding of energy and invention in protest and in politics that the feminist movement has brought onto the stage in these last years. And in fact, we are very close to next March 8, when the feminist strike and a lot of other activities will take place. Uh, and they are now in the making. Two elements that we have been discussing uh, about the feminist movement and its heterogeneity uh, are its massiveness and its radicality, and how important these features have been to shape its current power, or in Spanish, su potencia. Um, and this is my first question for you, Silvia. How can we think about this political political growth? And, and I don't know if political growth is the correct expression. Uh, taking into account your experience in the 70s, what are the aspects of the movement that are more powerful today from your point of view? I would like to uh, share that. OK, first of all, uh, I want to greet you all. It's a quite an amazing scene from here. Uh, it's beautiful to see so many people, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion because uh, the time called for a lot of collective thinking and collective action. And I want to thank also uh, the organizer of uh, this event. And of course, Veronica is always inspiring to be with you. About the question, this is a big question. Um, and uh, I'd like to, first of all, summarize, you know, in maybe two, three points, what is the growth that uh, we are talking about? And then see some of the factors that have been important in it. Uh, I would say that the, the growth, when we speak of a growth of feminism, First, as you said, you know, the massification. Today, uh, we have broad popular movements that call themselves feminists, particularly in the global south. But uh, feminism is not uh, only, it was massive at the beginning in the 70s, you know, but uh, all through the 80s, you know, we've seen many changes in it. But today, we can speak of, uh, in fact, in Latin America, one speaks of popular feminism, because these are movements that are really massive you know, in their connection with uh, a lot of social movements. Um, second, the radicality that Veronica referred to. You know, today, much more than ever, 
for example, in the 70s, there is a broad consciousness that you cannot really achieve any social justice, and not to mention uh, achieve the end of gender-based discrimination, you know, without changing the world, without changing the economic system, without a very radical transformation. And, uh, and third, and I, you know, I don't want to make a list in terms of importance, I think that what is happening today is that feminist movement are uh, broadening, have a perspective that is much broader than, for example, it was in the 70s. You know, where in the 70s, the, the, at the rise of the feminist movement, the key issue was, first of all, to understand and fight against you know, the discrimination against women, understand the roots of the particular form of exploitation against women, a lot of the work concentrated on the traditional forms of work that women have done, domestic labor, the issue of domesticity, sexuality has been the specific terrain and reproductive activities has been the specific terrain, you know, of feminist expo women's exploitation and feminist struggle. I think that much has happened uh, in the last four decades. And today we have feminist movement who basically are very aware that there is a feminine perspective on every aspect of social life, on every aspect of social relation. And we have feminist movement now, as we have in Argentina, for example, who speak about the question of environmental destruction, who are speaking against uh, the politics of death. And so there's been a broadening. Now, Again, you take a long time to go, why? Why this broadening? What has happened in the last uh, four decades? But uh, all the one way of summarizing is to say that the growth of the feminist movement has happened in a context of a massive expansion of capitalist relations worldwide, and particularly in the so-called global south, which is really the former colonial world. And, uh, and that uh, expansion has meant massive impoverishment, imposition of uh, very cruel um, austerity program. It has meant massive land privatization programs, etc. And because of that, you know, uh, generally there's been a massive deterioration in the condition of social reproduction. And, and this is where more and more the responses come from women, you know, because women have been everywhere, those who have suffered most because of the attack and the degradation of social reproduction. I mean, we can give thousands of examples, and maybe in the discussion we will, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, when a mine arrives you know, in a, in, a, in a region of the Amazon, or uh, a forest uh, is, uh, is cut down, you know, logging and so on, right? And uh, when the, the soil is being, uh, is being poisoned, you know, by the, you know, the chemicals that are put by a commercialized agriculture, or because of oil drilling and mining, you know, all of this implies, right, you know, tremendous increase in the amount of work that women have to do to reproduce their families. It Im implies uh, you know, a deterioration of people's health, implies an immense increase in the anguish with which people have to live on a day-to-day -day basis. And women in particular who are the ones responsible you know, for the reproduction of their family. So it is not surprising, in fact, it is not surprising that today we have feminist movement who are very massive, who have a perspective that really wants to change the world. And also a perspective that connects, connects the discrimination against women, you know, to the process of uh, destruction of the environment, to, you know, the imposition of austerity and impoverishment and to the politics that are pushing people off their land, off their houses, and so forth. So I think that, you know, again, uh, we see in so many parts of the world 
the women are really leading the struggle you know, against uh, this uh, war on the everyday reproduction of people's lives. Yes, at the same time, I think that this political growth is not the same in every part of the world. Absolutely, so absolutely. We have to think in different geographies and also different rhythms of, absolutely. The, of the movement. Yeah. And also the moment of uh, massive feminism is very clear when it is uh, a public moment on the streets. But also the question is, which are or what are the tasks when this massive moment is not so intense or not mm -hmm. so evident. So yeah. how we can uh, organize other levels yeah. and other rhythms of organization, of militancy, mm -hmm. and also to connect these moments of public visibility and also mm -hmm. other everyday practices, maybe more subterranean. Yeah, I think it's very important, sure, I mean, when we talk about massive movement and radicality, it's not uh, surprising that in fact we find that, you know, especially in uh, places throughout Latin America, for instance. Latin America in particular also, I think, for two reasons. You know, one is that the 500 years of colonization has given people a knowledge and understanding you know, of uh, you know, what are the true sources, what are the social processes that are impacting on people's lives. And also Latin America because uh, it has maintained also this continent and this uh, indigenous tradition, which is a tradition of uh, collectivism, a tradition of uh, you know, communal social relations, and so has never lost the sense of an alternative. I never lost the sense and, and the connection and the practice of an alternative to the kind of individualization of life, to the kind of isolationism that has been brought you know, by capitalist relation. And uh, about uh, what, what uh, to do, the rhythms of struggles. Yes, struggles are very, very, sometimes very unpredictable rhythms. And I think it's very important. This is something that I've always underlined, you know, in all my work, that uh, we should not only keep the eyes, you know, fixed on the great moments of struggle when everybody, millions on the street and in the protest and so forth, which are extremely important, but equally important and in the long term, in the long term essential you know, is the more day-to-day -day invisible necessary work of building what I now come to call, you know, building the infrastructure for struggles. You know, you need a kind of infrastructure, you know, in order to be able to reproduce, it. we need to reproduce our life on a day-to-day -day basis, right? But we need an infrastructure also to be able to struggle, the continuity, what allows the struggle to grow, what allows the struggle not to dissipate, to dissipate when the moment of being all together in the street is gone. And I think that there is a knowledge that is being uh, uh, acquired about the fact that there is all the day-to-day -day work of uh, uh, building relationship a building, for example, you know, um, forms of activity, forms of reproduction that uh, are strengthening the social tissue, are strengthening the solidarity that women, people have in the community and, and uh, providing the strength that then allows them, you know, to confront the state from a position of more power. And, uh, and so we see, I mean, this is one of the things, uh, a lot of my writing more and more has been inspired by my experience coming, for example, to places like Argentina or Chile or Mexico, you know, where I've seen the work, you know, uh, the building of, for example, collective forms of reproduction, you know, the comedores, populares, the garden, etc. you know, that are not only necessary in terms of 
providing new forms of survival, you know, stretching the budget, you know, but also they are important because they are bringing people together. They are breaking down the isolation, you know, they are creating the circulation of knowledge, a circulation of experiences, and they are really changing, they are really changing the, the tissue of, of everyday life. And, um, and also, I know, for instance, being impressed by and this, you know, the kind of um, interest which uh, in, uh, in what we in so many collective and groups are, do, are calling political formation. So that together with the Comedores Populares and the activities in the community, there is also a tremendous effort, actually, to reread history, to you know, discuss creating you know, discussion of political events, etc. So this is the work. This is the day-to-day -day work that I think uh, is not only allows basically the struggle not to dissipate, but is indispensable for its growth. I was thinking also, and we were discussing that in our seminar about the desire for theory mm -hmm. that the feminist practices are developing today. Absolutely, and yes. You can see a lot of, um, I don't know, uh, self-formation or self-education and yes. pedagogies of feminist initiatives and a lot of uh, well, books, pamphlets, and it's a very yeah. hot discussion, Absolutely. also in conceptual terms. And mm -hmm. I think this is interesting how to think that the feminist uh, practices are not anti-intellectualism. Oh, absolutely. No, absolutely. I think that today, for me, the feminist movement today is one of the most interesting in terms of, for example, the whole discussion of social reproduction, but in, in terms of re-understanding, basically uh, looking and examining all the different forms of organizational work, you know, and social relations, and there is really a, a blossoming of, of materials, I mean, as you said, books, and, 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 and above all, this everyday you know, formation of groups that are carrying on you know, the analysis of uh, both history. The, for instance, with tremendous amount of work about uh, recuperating and uh, the collective memory, you know, and then rediscovering the importance of memory, you know, how memory, you know, is not just uh, the day, the day of memory, okay, so we celebrate, you know, so we have the day, the banners, and then so forth, but actually collective memory is the painstaking work of actually rethinking the past and uh, making sure, and, uh, you know, in that rethinking of the past, there is also a process of establishing a solidarity with those who came before us, who those who struggle, you know, who those whose name might not be remembered, and uh, making sure that they are present. You know, making sure. Uh, I have often quoted, you know, a, a, an activist who is going to be here at the end of the month. Gladys Tutsu, who is a fantastic, fantastic uh, scholar, activist from Guatemala, you know, who has written some very, very important book on uh, the organization of communal life, you know, in the indigenous people of the high plan of Totonicapan. And, uh, you know, we were discussing about uh, the fact that in Guatemala today, you have so many struggles going on. And, uh, and I was expressing my, my surprise because um, having read what took place in the 80s, the kind of horror that uh, you know, people witness, the unspeakable, you know, entire villages destroyed, people burnt alive, etc. And yet, the, the struggle continue. People find the courage. And I said, Gladys, what drives people to continue this struggle? And she said, well, you know, for us, for us, the past is not as for many other people. For us, the past and those who died, 
and, and do not really die. You know, there's, we have a relationship with the past and with those who died that really, in a sense, keeps them alive. And so for us, even the idea of death is not as destructive, it's not the end of everything, because we always feel that we are part of a broader body. We are part of a much larger body than ourselves. And that, that gives us the courage to continue, because we know that if we die, it's not, it's not the end of everything, but that our life is one part of something larger than ourselves. And uh, that, that, that has stayed with me as really one of those things that impacted me. And then I began to realize how this issue of memory, of recuperating, you know, tejendo, no? Weaving, weaving, con this constant process of weaving, weaving the past into the present. That I never forget those who have gone before as being so much part and has given people so much, so much strength, right? So much strength. Because the moment you play yourself in something broader, the moment you place yourself in a much broader struggle for human liberation, you know, you, you gain a different view about what you're doing. You gain a different courage. You gain a different strength. And, uh, and I think they say, this is what is happening. You know, this is part of the desire for knowledge and this broader communication that is taking place. Beautiful. Uh, also, in the current debate in the feminist movement, and especially related to the practice of the feminist strike, it is very important the issue of labor, and in yeah. particular, uh, reproductive labor. Right. And you, in the 70s, well, launched this uh, campaign for uh, which? wages for housework, <laughs> and you. Uh, wrote a lot about the patriarchy of the wage. Right. And I was wondering what does it mean today? Right. To think uh, also reproduction in terms of precarity, precarization, but also in terms of financialization of everyday life. And also how to translate the, the feminist strike uh, in terms of demands when the wage is not the main mm -hmm. issue for reproduction nowadays, but also with this issue of debt as a central issue. Right. So that's a, that's a broad, another broad, <laughs> you know, and there's so much to say, you know, because, uh, yeah, wages for housework, I mean, for years I've been haunted, you know. Every time I open my mouth, People will say, ah, but wages for house, aren't you going to institutionalize women in the home? And I would say, oh, good, why don't you give up your wages so that you free yourself from capitalism? Because only, people only saw the institutionalization of women in the home or the supporting capitalism when he spoke about wages for women. But when he spoke about their own wages, they would never think of going to a labor movement or to a labor and say, F workers, give up your wages because getting wages is institutionalizing yourself in your job, you know? So I, I've always been struck how deeply internalized, you know, this conflict between women and money, you know? And, I mean, I've told Veronica that I always wanted to write uh, a book that hopefully we'll write together called Women, Money, and the Devil. <laughs> because when uh, I started working about on, uh, you know, Caliban and the Witch, you know, yeah, I, I was always struck that uh, in, in all the representation of how do you become a witch, right? And it's the moment that you say, oh my God, I'm so terrible, my life is horrible, and then the devil comes and he says, okay, don't worry, I'll take care of everything, but, but you have to become my servant, right? And of course, becoming the servant is, is a copulation, and he gives us some money. And then the money, however, disappears. It is always said later on that the money that the devil gives the witch you know, in exchange for the pact, after a few days, it becomes ashes. And this has been, it's been in my mind. It is. 
So this, this, this antagonism between women and money, the capitalism has planted. You know, this, this exclusion of women from the money economy has been so deep that even in the pact with the devil, even in the pact with the devil, she support. But coming to the question, you know, so number one, I would say the struggle for monetary income is not over yet because money is still the gate to our survival in so many ways. So in fact, just uh, we have gone through a massive movement in the United States for a rise for the minimum wage, right? And I don't think we can go and tell all those people who are fighting to go from $7 an hour to 15, don't do it because you're going to be institutionalized. Right? I don't think we can say that because that money is still necessary. However, however, it's also very important to see, I think there's been a change in, uh, in uh, the capitalist ability, capacity to manipulate you know, wages and, and monetary uh, realities to begin with. You know? So, um, for instance, in the last 30 years, you know, with the structural adjustment program imposed by the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank on uh, so many countries, you know, in the name of the so-called debt crisis, we have seen massive devaluation. We have seen massive devaluation. I went to Nigeria in 1984. At that time, the Nigerian currency, the Naira, was one Naira, one dollar. You know, by the time I left, it was uh, one Naira and a hundred or two hundred Nairas and one dollar. And now it's like a thousand or more Nairas. In fact, the Naira has gone off practically, you know, the, 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 the range of exchangeable currencies. And there was a joke in Brazil in the 80s that if you took a cab, you know, at the beginning of the ride, you couldn't figure out, they wouldn't tell you, you know, what the cost was because in the space of the ride, the money would be devalued. So the capacity to devalue, right? And then uh, it's, uh, it's also something that should really now so I think we have to think of a variety of ways. The wage, you know, if you read Marx, the wage has been historically what the, the, the workers have been able to reclaim of the wealth they have produced. It's what they've been able to take back, you know, from the wealth they have produced. But there are many other ways. So yes, social services, the women's movement always, social services, social services, very good. But we should also have social services that we also control. Because the social services can also be, for example, daycare centers can be parking lots for our children, right? And uh, so, and uh, senior citizens, you know, nursing home are places where you go to die often. Because when they're publicly funded, we know that they are really horrendous places in many cases. Um, because they are totally defunded. Not accidentally, most people died of COVID in this. So we need to be very, look at the question of social services with a very critical eye and not to think and to organize in, in, in communities in a way that if we speak of social services, we speak of services that where we have a say, where we have a way of deciding and not allowing simply the state to decide what schools, what health care, you know, what daycare center, what senior centers we need. And then material, material goods, right? Land, housing, you know, and uh, so all of this. So it's not that we have to think of monetary income as the only one, right? And, uh, but we know the monetary income is still extremely important. And in fact, 
We're talking about labor. I don't know if you know that uh, a large majority of women in the United States who have wage jobs, in fact, it's particularly among women who have wage jobs, that you have the highest level of debt, in addition to students, in addition to students, but you have the highest level of debt because the income that the majority of women of a wage make is not enough, even though often they have two jobs, sometimes even three, is not enough to give them autonomy, to give them the possibility to. So, you know, now uh, most women have to take a debt. And uh, with the entrance of women in the massive entries in the wage workforce, you have the appearance of payday loan, you know? So massive, uh, so this, this is where the, the, the question of uh, money is complicated, yeah. This is, uh, in fact, the current situation in Argentina. Yeah. And this feminist strike is against IMF, against debt, also the, the different uh, demands are about social, uh, security, housing, yeah. and I think this sort of programmatic dimension of the right. feminist strike is completely uh, related to social reproduction. Absolutely, and, and absolutely. How yeah. We can reappropriate social wealth. Yeah, in that yeah. Sense. yeah. I, I want to, to ask you, uh, especially about uh, after the pandemic, we were uh, discussing the question of time and the mm -hmm. dispute of time and, and work. Yeah. And we have been investigating how the, the, pandemics, uh, the pandemic begins to show the proliferation of debt, but also the financial exploitation of our territories and especially communitarian and domestic uh, work. And you said in, in some conversation, that uh, we are facing a restructuring of class relations that take this fear of reproduction as its main stage. Yeah. And I would like to, 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 to yeah. think about that because it is a, a very important hypothesis and a very strong formula. So what does yeah, it mean? It, yeah, it means, I, I think, that basically the, the, the bulk of the... Of the if you want to say, I call it a war, <laughs> a war on people's reproduction. You know, um, wherever you turn, wherever you turn uh, your eyes, you can see that. You know, this, uh, I, I think the most visible evidence of uh, this war is uh, are the massive migration movements that we see all over the world. And uh, the massive reality of refugee camps Today, the, the, the worker, the image of the worker is not the image of the person at the assembly line. It's the immigrant. You know, today, I mean, yesterday, 60 people died in the Mediterranean. You know, the Mediterranean is a, is a grave. It's now a grave. They calculated 20,000 people or more coming from different parts of the Middle East and Africa. So it's a scandal. When we talk about war, I'm not exaggerating. So we know the, the scenes uh, at the frontier. And so there's really a major, a major restructuring uh, uh, that has to do, I think, with this uh, you know, massive corporate move to basically take control, possession of every important resource for the reproduction of people across the world. I think there is a plan for example, to separate people from land, from access to independent means of reproduction, right? To independent means of reproduction. So that you'd have companies that will control all the soil, the subsoil, they will control the trees, the seas. Already, they are, uh, for example, in Latin America, and again, a community of fishermen who cannot fish any longer because uh, the, the beach has been taken over by companies. And so the, the little fishermen for generation and generation. So this is what I mean, a restructuring of class relation. And to transform the population of what used to be the working class, you know, into people are completely, 
And I'm saying expandable. I don't believe that capitalism doesn't need worker. I think that this is a propaganda that is needed. People are working today more than ever. It's propaganda. It's like the unemployed are not working. I mean, we, under we just understood, we just heard that children 13 years old in the United States, hundreds of children. Now we just told that this last week over the news that they are discovering that hundreds of immigrant children, not just even adults, but children are employed in every area of in every area of work. Right. So this is the uh, and of course there are these tools. You know, there is war, there is expulsion, there is a structural adjustment, and and the debt. You know, the debt, which is really a very artificially created uh, instrument, because these debts that you know countries have paid over and over and over, and will continue for the next, uh, unless there is a strong struggle against it. Yeah. You have here the experience of a strike against debt. It was a, yeah. a main issue during Occupy and Absolutely. So How do you think that we can update this idea of a strike against debt? Yeah. I think we have to turn the table. I think we have absolutely to turn the table. And I think the women's movement I, and I really have to say Nuna Menos has been a leading in that direction and also women in Europe. And we have to say, you know, the title of a number of writings that have been produced by feminists, who holds to whom? And we have to say, you, the state, are in debt towards us. You, the state, are in debt towards us. We are not the one who have to pay now, but you are in debt because we have done unpaid labor for generation and generation and generation, continue to do unpaid labor in so many different ways of all type, physical, emotional, etc. And so it's the state who owes us, it's not us who owes the state. So to speak of a women's debt or to speak of an African debt, imagine millions of people have been taken away from Africa. African has been exploited of every resource and so many other parts of the world, Latin America. And then to speak of the African, that is an obscenity, it's grotesque. And uh, we, you know, I think we really have, we really have to wake up to, to, to realize you know, of how grotesque it is, for example, to accept that they have been able to impose this idea that there is an African debt which now has grown immensely because they will never be able to pay. And so the interest, it's like the student debt. People take $10,000 $10, and then they fail to pay. And then five years later, they owe 100000 You know? Did you hear that there are people now, that they are 91 years old, who have a student debt? The, last, the, the latest news was about a couple of days ago about people who are in their 90s and they still have a student debt in the United States. I know several people who had to migrate. They had to migrate because they were sinking, you know, from, uh, and they went to other countries to, to escape the debt. So I think that we have to turn the table and we have to really expose the rhetoric of the debt. The debt was artificially created by the Federal Reserve of the United States in 1979 when they increased the interest on the dollar. And the new interest, the new increases that are passing now are, are, in, are now having a tremendous new effect. All the debts of the world, including the one in Argentina, as well as the debt that every person has, because you have the national debt, right? Which means in the name of that, austerity. And then you have the personal debt, because with the national debt, and then you have to take a credit card, and then you have to, and there are now, you know, people who live from credit card to credit card until they collapse. So this is a policy, you know, there is war uh, with certain means, and there is war with financial means. And that's what the debt is about. It's a war. <laughs> to, to change the fundamental condition of reproduction. Related to that, um, how do you characterize the, the current backlash? I think that 
you have the experience of the backlash yeah. after the 70s. And I think that yeah. it could be a, a sort of comparison. But also, um, I wanted to ask you if you use the, the term fascism, hmm. you think, in the current situation. You know, the term fascism has been used so, so <laughs> broadly that if you, yes, that, uh, so it should be nice to also use it more. But yeah, I would say that, um, you know, using it in the broad sense, that there's been uh, a fascistization, you know, of economic life, you know, that uh, the, the fascistization of culture is really a reflex of the fascistization of economic life that we're talking about, you know, when you destroy the, the condition of existence of millions of people, when you destroy the condition of existence and uh, you impose lives that are non-lives, you know, then uh, you have to use every form of violence. And uh, it's not an accident that a lot of the violence, you know, cultural as well as physical, is addressed against women, in using women in the broad sense of the term. Um, because women are really the center. How do you degrade you know, the everyday reproduction of life without first waging a war on women? who are the primary subject to this day of reproduction. They are not the only subject, but they are the primary subject to this day, whether it is healthcare, whether it is housework, whether it is child raising, it's really mostly women. So how do you degrade social reproduction unless you also wage an attack? So to me, for example, the question of abortion is much bigger. It's a much bigger issue. It's not only that capitalism wants more worker. Right now, they have a lot of workers. But uh, there's a whole, the, the attack on abortion has a whole disciplinary effect because it is an attack on women's sexuality, on women's autonomy. It's a bonus given to men, to patriarchal men who are being attacked in their wages. They are being attacked in their jobs, but they can feel a boss in their home. And so, you know, giving men the control of a women's life you know, having a woman who is submitted and not, not uh, you know, being, being uh, not free to exercise, you know, uh, her autonomy. And so that, that's the way we have to see it. Yeah, with the way we have to see it. Yeah. So the, the backlash uh, also has to do with this fascistization yeah. of economic life. And oh, at yeah. the same time, yes. This, uh, Yes, absolutely, because uh, it is even true that a lot of the proclamation of feminism by certain institutions, like the Democratic Party in the United States, right, have never really translated on a real support. Where, where, what, what are the manifestations? What is beside the, you know, the wording and proclamation and, and but, uh, when it comes to actual policies, to actual policies that could have changed women's life, right? Like, for example, the famous services, you know, the women have been uh, struggling for, you know, services. There are millions of women in this country, as across the world, who are imprisoned in the home because, you know, they have to take care of people who are chronically ill or they are sandwiches, that's the word that is being used, between young children and elderly parents, relatives that are depending on them. Where are the services? Where are the places? If anything, for the last 30 years, this uh, center for senior citizens or for daycare center have been the first to be cut you know, when it comes to austerity. And now, for example, that we see billions and billions and billions every day going to Ukraine. I, I fear <laughs> what is going to happen to whatever remains of the social services that we have. Where is the money? We are going to be told there is no money left. At the same time, we were talking about the importance of the nurses strike, for example, to... Absolutely, and I think it was very powerful that they, you know, fought against the blackmail 
which is a blackmail that is put on so many people doing reproductive work. Oh, you cannot because people's life depends on you. Well, people's life depends on you. But meanwhile, New York State has shut down 42 hospitals between 2017 and no, 2003 and 2019. So the nurses should stay on their place, um, you know, with meager wages and terrible condition and seeing people die who didn't need to die. But the states shut down, you know, faulty hospitals because they couldn't fill the beds every night. And so they were not productive, right? This is what we are talking about. Uh, this continuous assault on the infrastructure that are necessary for the reproduction of life. Yeah. Yes, you use a, a, like a formula that I love that is how much can we shift our reproductive activity from the reproduction of labor power to the reproduction of our power to struggle. Right, this is and the I enchant in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think I mean, you know, I'm saying, okay, we can measure how much we are successful by how much we are, you know, in our collective activities, in our collective activity, are able to really, you know, withdraw, you know, the work that we do to reproduce uh, ourselves, our community, our family as workers, to reproduce them, to fit, you know, to fit. The, the requirements of the organization of work and uh, how much we can actually dedicate our energy, our time, you know, to build a different world, to construct different form of relation, different kind of infrastructures, like the one that I was referring before, you know, uh, you know the, the collective kitchen, the places where you know, you can take care of other people collectively, and which, which at this stage, in, at this stage, is not an issue of replacing the state. It's not a place, it, an issue of sharing our poverty. It's an issue of strengthening relation that enable us to, in fact, have more power when we deal with the institution, right? It's very, very different, for instance. Uh, just one simple example, you know, coming from uh, black feminist, black women communities, who more and more hesitate to go to a hospital alone when they have to give birth. And uh, you know, the whole institution of the doula, who's not a medical person, but is an advocate who comes with you to ensure that when you are in a hospital, you know you're not you're you're treated with respect, and uh, and uh, what you have to say is taken seriously because we are seeing the racism that is still so prevailing that women are not taken seriously when they you know put forward, and uh, so think of that. Right? The idea, no, we cannot go confront the institution alone. Right? And uh, I think a lot of these activities that we have seen in the visions of Argentina, for instance, right? where women create places for first aid, or places for the children, or places for where people eat together, or cook together, and not always the same women, but you, know, you go to the, to the place and there is a list. Today, these women are cooking, and these young men too, and tomorrow another group, etc. And you cook hundreds and hundreds of meals, and or the garden, the communal garden. And this is what then allows them to go together to the municipality and say, "We need water in our streets. You know, we need the light. We need this. We need that. You know." So it's not a question of replacing the state, but to create the kind of solidarity that comes from uh, meeting with the people you struggle with, not as strangers, but as person that you know, as person with whom you have effective relation. 
you know, and, and, and also working collectively expands our imagination. I don't know if you've had the experience, but if you are alone in your bedroom, there is so much you can imagine, so much you can think of. But then you are with thousands of other people in the street, and all of a sudden, your brain expands. <laughs> Your imagination expands. The sense of what is possible expands. And I think that this is what, you know, the, the enchanting that uh, it means to, to resignify our day-to-day -day life. To resignify our day-to-day -day life. So that instead of being a burden, it becomes also a place of new relation and new discovery. If we have to build a new world, there's going to be a lot of experimentation. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of work, you know, to also free ourselves of all the capitalism we have internalized, all the fears, all the hesitation, etc. And I think that that work, the invisible work, eh? that is so important, really, for, uh, for really creating new forms of struggle, not the traditional one, where you go out and the flags and everything, but then you don't know if the person is next to you. Yeah. And, and why do you choose this notion of re-enchantment? I use the notion of re-enchantment. I mean, the word came from Max Weber, right? Max Weber spoke of the fact that capitalism disenchants the world because uh, capitalism introduces you know, a kind of um, bureaucratic rationality, you know, into, into the, the, the process of social relation. And I realized, no, there's a lot more than that. You know, there's a lot more, for example, the way capitalism has changed or wanting to change our relationship to the natural world, right? And uh, the way capitalism has uh, affected our relationship to each other, right? Teaching us continuously, continuously obsessed with other people are a threat. You know, the, the self-made individual, the fear of the other, the other person as a fear, not as, as a wealth, right? Not, not as an enrichment, relationship with other people, not, you know, seen as, as an enrichment. So the magic, the magic that always exists, I mean, this world, you know, magic, the word magia, there is a Greek word, it means knowledge, it's a particular type of knowledge, right? It's not a something, you know, uh, but it, it means, but the, the, there is a knowledge that uh, we can draw just by observing our day-to-day -day relationship with other people, right? I mean, we are moved by music. How do we explain the fact that music is moving us? We are moved by words that other people say to us. You know, the experience of love. You know, in the Renaissance, they had an idea that actually what keeps the world going, you know, the moon, the stars, the, the, the movement, the cycle, the seas, you know, is something similar to the power of love, you know the power of attraction. Now we talk about gravity, but it's far more than gravity. Right? Capitalism destroys that. Even uh, our relationship to our own body. Most women hate their own body, you know, because they are presenting us this uh, imagery, these models, and uh, to which nobody can, uh, you know, emulate. And uh, so this sense of uh, constant dissatisfaction with our life, and uh, I think we have to fight against that. And I think part of the struggle is the recuperating of the magic of the world, the relationship with the natural world, the relationship with animals. And I think that this is happening. I think people are realizing that. I think that the consciousness of it, you know, as we are seeing the destruction that is taking place every day, I think the more and more, this is not just, it's not my, my way. I think uh, it's very broad, especially among, among women. Silvia, um, I think that uh, an extraordinary experience in the feminist uh, protests and mobilizations um, has been going through this feeling of 
internationalism, yeah. or transnationalism, and this capacity to connect and to produce proximity between different yeah. geographies and different yeah. struggles. We were talking about the, the situation of women in Iran, in particular, yeah. and also I wanted to know how do you feel this dimension of transnational yeah. struggle? You were part of this feminist collective. Right, it was international, right. International, and you are always underlying that yeah. dimension against localism, yeah. and also against the idea of a narrow framework of yeah. our struggles. Yeah, so we need we need local, we need the local. I'm not against the local, on the contrary, everything, the local is the basis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the local is where, where the, the deepest knowledge we have is in the local. But we need the international, because capitalism is international, because the forms of exploitation, because we have the same, the same, uh, the people who are organizing labor and and the and the, the use of resources, right? They are organizing it internationally. So we need that. So we need that to, and uh, still very important, you know, to insist that we don't have. Uh, models of uh, you know a future society that have to be universal or general far from it right they are very different cultural history trajectory you know you know the zapatistas say one no many yeses no to exploitation but many yeses to what kind of societies we can build there are many ways of having a just society right but we need that connection, we need that circulation of struggle because uh, what happened in one place has a direct effect on another. And so we have to really build networks that can circulate those information and circulate those struggle. And I think that today this is happening. It's really yeah, the way the response that came to when Nuna Meno launched the call for the women's strike, I think really show that people understand and they want that. Yeah. It is amazing also the, the experience of political translation. Absolutely, yes. Without maybe the, the same vocabulary, but that yes. produce yeah. a common understanding. A common understanding because so much, yeah, so much of what is happening is now replicated across the world in different ways. Yeah. And just to, to finish our conversation and to have questions from the public, uh, you talk about joyful <laughs> militancy, <laughs> and I, I like very much. And this does not mean that organizing is yeah. something easy or something given, no. but um, how do you characterize this idea of joyful? Oh, I think it came in response to a number of situations in which I was and where, you know, you hear, her, oh no, another meeting, oh no, another thing, oh no, oh, I have to go to this and I have to go to that. And, it, and this sense of, oh, you know, this struggle that's supposed to liberate us and make our life better and expand is becoming another form of alienated labor. So I said to myself, no. The struggle cannot be alienated labor, right? So you might give you suffering, you may take risk, and, but no, the, if it is alienated labor, then there's something wrong with it. And, and then more and more, you know, more deeply to realize that, you know, if, if, if engaging in activities that are aiming to change something, to change some of your reality, or to change something of this world. You know, uh, if, if doing that is not really, in a sense, improving, giving something positive to our everyday life, you know, then we cannot, we cannot be surprised that so many people prefer to go see football or go to a movie or get drunk rather than uh, you know engage so that this becomes a political issue that uh, if we organize we have to organize in a way that it is constructive that also give us joy 
right? They also give us, makes us feel that it's worth doing it. <laughs> Make us feel that, yes, I do it because I need it, because uh, it changes something. It takes away some of the pain of being alone, of confronting this world alone, uh, the pain of, of, of feeling that, oh, everything is useless, the pain of, of continuously watching the, the, the kind of world in which we live, which is a terrible. Uh, and and uh, so that's where joyful militance comes, right? We have to build the joy, the pleasure, you know. So we talk to women, domestic workers from uh, Spain in Madrid, this fantastic group called Territorio Domestico. And if actually one of the women, Rafaela Pimentel, she's going to come here. You're going to meet her. She's a fantastic woman. And, uh, you know, they all said, you know, these are immigrant women in Madrid from different parts of the world, you know, facing God knows how many difficulties. And they decided they know that to continue to organize, they had to have music, dancing, eating together. They had to build within the organizing moments of joy, moments of pleasure, moments of uh, affectivity building, so that ah, you want to go to the meeting because you want to see this woman, you want to see the other woman, because you want to see, because you, because you have something, because people become part of your life. Yeah, there's an emotional investment and people become part of your life. And this is what the continuity of the struggle, this is the enchantment. This is not like going to a demonstration. I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to a demonstration, please. <laughs> but, it's, but it's not, but engaging in some form of social transformation of activity cannot be something that uh, occurs only in a context where you are one among many and you don't have a real change in your everyday life. There has to be an improvement in the everyday life. Yeah. And also I think that this idea of joyful is yeah. something against the notion of victimization. Oh, yes. As yes. the main uh, yeah. subject uh, position yes. to go to struggle. Yeah, joy is an active virtue. Yeah, joy is not a passive one. Yeah, joy is uh, is something that uh, you know gives you revitalizes us, right? That uh, give us the desire, you know, to move, to do things, to connect, to expand. Yeah, so that's good. Uh, to me, it's become one of my, of my, um, yeah, doctrines. <laughs> well, I yeah. think we can say thank you very much to Celia. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Uh, I had a question regarding the, um, the notion of from indigenous communities uh, and the, the, the surge of the, of the Warmi Pachacuti uh -huh. that my mom, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, uh, talks yes. a lot about sí. and how this is confluence with what you're saying on uh, like this, this moment we are in history where we see this, this feminist movement growing in, in, in so many spheres, but at the same time there's such a backlash uh, and and how this relates with this notion that has to do with more with, with indigenous peoples and, and the Warmi Pachacuti. Thanks. Yeah, you know, I was saying that, uh, you know, one of, of the reasons I think that, uh, you know, certain forms of struggle are particularly strong, for example, in South America, is precisely because of that, you know, of this amazing struggle that indigenous communities have made, you know, to not be erased, to not have their history, their forms of organization destroyed. And, uh, and I think that this kind of more ability uh, to, to, you know, organize struggle in a collective way, to see the collectivism, to see communalism, Right, as fundamental to the struggle and to think of another world, yeah, to think of an alternative. I think this is really part of the indigenous story of the Americas. You know? And um, so this is, yeah, I think is very powerful. And uh, I think the fact that the, since the, at least the late 80s, early 90s, we have seen this big surge of a pan-indigenous movement that's also, I think, has deeply affected the feminist movement, you know, from Chiapas, you know, to Standing Rock, you know, I think it has been a tremendous influence. Yeah. And also, I think that your mother's thought is uh, very important for us, for the different feminists. Uh, collectives and practices, and also how uh, Sylvia uh, challenged the idea of the minorities to think yeah. about women, indigenous, uh, black communities, etc. So I think this is very powerful tool for us. Hello. Hello. Um, first, just to say immense respect. You both are such beacons across generations. And so thank you for your work. Thank you for your ongoing inspiration. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask a question about self-defense. I think that one of the most powerful aspects of Caribbean and Latin American feminist struggles has been a focus on people fighting back, people fighting against their abusers, fighting against the police. Um, there being a focus on the ability to um, embody a different kind of militancy. And a question that I have is, are there ways that we can learn from the struggles that are happening in the Caribbean and Latin America around changing definitions of militancy that don't um, put that to the side, that we need to fight for our lives and keep each our, ourselves and each other safe, um, but that can also not um, adopt a certain approach to violence that may actually uh, disfigure our movements. Well, you know, um, yeah, I, I think a lot, a lot of uh, struggle that um, you know communities have made, you know, to defend the land. To the, and you know, the question is again, how do you define, you know, violence? No, uh, I was in a in a small pueblo, maybe three four hundred people, uh, some years ago, where a gold mine had come, and uh, you could see, you know, the gold mine was an open sky and it had a cloud of dust always perennial in front of them, and there was an assembly, and old women were very proud to say 
that they had confronted, you know, the people of the gold mine with their sticks. Uh, these were women who could hardly stand up, but then they confronted, right? Well, I don't call that violence, right? And uh, I think that uh, where the violence becomes a violence not only against a self-defense, against the people who have taken away, you know, your resources, your life, but uh, it becomes also, you know, a move to a militaristic conception of life. You know, I think this is where you draw the line, which then becomes violent also against the people that you're fighting with. And uh, I think in a lot of community, like the Zapatistas, for instance, we have seen it over and over and over, right, that care not to turn, that you arm yourself, but you are fighting at the same time against the militaristic conception of life. And uh, I think this is, to me, the, the important distinctions. But also, I think that it's interesting to think about how to um, broader the concept of self-defense. For example, in terms of what does it mean uh, a financial self-defense, for example, against that. Mm -hmm. And I think that could be interesting to expand the yeah. idea of self-defense and also to think in a collective body uh, mm -hmm. as the subject of self-defense. That is, I think, interesting yeah. to, to, to produce a sort of deplacement of the idea of the individual self-defense. I know the self-defense is precisely in the building of the collectivity. That's the, the best form of self-defense. The self-defense is where, you know, you're not afraid to tell your problems to the person that you're fighting with. It's where you socialize, you know, uh, you know where, you know, the, the, again, I mean, uh, the story of it, women was told to me from the MST, uh, the Landless Movement of Brazil, that when they would take over land, you know, the men wanted to build their farms in different isolated places. And they said, no, 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 let's build all the houses together. So when we scream and somebody is beating us up, you know, everybody can run, right? And uh, so that we can actually help each other and protect each other so that their vicinity, that's self-defense. Thank you very much for this. Wonderful conversation. I have a question that it is a little far of this dialogue, but uh, maybe this is the only opportunity that I have for asking you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, actually, I found an article of Alaide Fopa. I don't know if you remember Alaide Fopa is mm. one of the oh, yeah. most fe uh, mm -hmm. wonderful feminist yes. writers in Mexico, yes. and she she wrote about the salary for domestic work in the in the 70s. And actually, in that uh, article, she wrote about the campaigns that uh, Italian feminists uh, and Marxist feminists were doing at that time, and she mentioned Mar Maria Rosa de, la Costa. de la Costa and Selma James, mm -hmm. and also Nora Federici. And I wanted to ask you if, uh, do you have a uh, second name? Or there is a Nora like Federici, a but it's not me. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And I am sorry for this question, but uh, for me, it was like a big coincidence. And yeah. As you were part of those like struggles, I I thought that you were the same person. But thank no, you very no, much, no, and no, I am no, really no. sorry. No. <laughs> no, I was. I mean, uh, yeah, I was here in New York, and uh, we we created in uh, the International Feminist Collective was in 1972 in July, formed with the specific purpose of launching in different countries the campaign for wages for housewives. And so there was also women from France, and mostly it was women from Italy. The, the meeting was at Maria Rosa's house, and I was from the States. But don't, yeah, but I know there is another Federici. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for the talk today. I wanted to talk about the place of the citizen as uh, 
yeah, as, as a concept and as a forum that we are uh, able to, to find in our daily lives. But as a, as a process that you may be seeing that maybe it was important like for, for the fights of the 70s and how it's like that maybe uh, getting to contradiction nowadays or how um, it's important to keep like thinking about that uh, institutionalized form of, the, of being part of something, like of the society in a democratic way. So that was my question. The citizenship, the issue of citizenship. Yes. Well, it's a very complicated thing, eh? Very complicated because, uh, yes, of course, there's a struggle for citizenship, but also citizenship used as a means of exclusion, right? So, for example, I know now in Italy that, uh, you know, there is a, a big struggle among African communities to be able to vote at least at the local level without having citizenship and being able to have access to all kinds of benefits without having citizenship, right? So we should have a universal citizenship. If you are in a place, you work in a place, then, but the way citizenship is used is used in a way that is actually to exclusionary purposes. And this is really the problem, which doesn't mean that people won't fight for it, but that this, in fact, is we have to be very, very careful. So for instance, right now, there is a, a struggle in Europe because uh, you know many are fighting for a basic universal income, and in some countries called a citizenship income. Actually, I think in Italy it is called a citizenship income, and that's very exclusionary. So the all these people, the people who need it most, because are among those that are worst paid, the most precarious, and so on, cannot have any access because they're. So actually, people are actually making a struggle against this idea of using citizenship as access to certain, to certain benefits. Thank you so much um, for this uh, beautiful and wonderful conversation. And I have a question about um, the university. So in your book, there's this beautiful short text called uh, Under the University, oh, yeah, the, Commons. the Commons, beautiful. Yes. And um, so, of course, here we're in a private university, uh, and it seems that feminism enters the universities, right, via like yeah, conversations such as this. There, there's courses, there's books, but there's but kind of like the university keeps operating in this, you know, corporative um, way. And uh, so, I wanted to ask you about your even about your own biography, you know, like you, you used to publish in, in venues that are not university presses. So it's like, what, right. is, what is your, is there a chance to re-enchant the university? <laughs> are we doomed? Um, that's my question. Look, to me, every place is a place of struggle. And my university life has been really a continuous struggle. Every place that I've been, <laughs> every place that I've been. And at the same time, I never give up the idea that you should fight in university. So um, I lived in Nigeria with my partner and uh, other people, and we were there at the time when uh, the IMF came uh, and was imposing on African countries this brutal you know, structural adjustment program, very grotesque in many ways. And one effect was of cutting all the funds to the university, right? And in fact, there was a famous story that uh, in 1986, at the conference of African VC uh, in Harare, the representative of the World Bank said, but Africa doesn't need universities, you know? Because they already had in mind a global restructuring of the economy where Africa would be cheap labor. And that's what we understood. Right, and uh, so because of that, there was an amazing struggle, student struggle, which unfortunately was never reported in Europe and the US very little. You know, everybody talked about the student movement in China, but the amazing struggle and, and the cost the African student paid, immense cost, students killed, jailed. There was a massacre in 85, you know, in, uh, in Zaria, at the University of Amadou Bello, 30 students massacred, and others that we don't know, but at least not 30. 
So we began, we began a, a, a project with then other people that went on for 13 years called the Committee for Academic Freedom in Africa, which was uh, an organization. We used the academic freedom provocatively as students were using it. Academic freedom is a very conservative term. Has always been used to pro to by conservative academician who wanted to say we don't have to deal with social issues, right? But uh, at that time, you know, student there was a, f a famous uh, meeting in Kampala in '84, and the students in Kampala said, you know, we're academic freedom. Academic freedom is the right to have education for free. And, and so we used it in that sense. But unfortunately, many people, but in any case. <laughs> and, and, uh, and when we did that, and for many, many years, we began to report on A, student struggles, and B, doing an analysis. What is this attack on the university? What is the attack on the schools that the IMF was doing, right? And we realized that it was connected to the big restructuring of labor power of the organizational work across the world. That actually the uh, educational policies were very connected with labor politics and with the fact that you know, certain population were being degraded. And so we, we began this kind of analysis and this kind of, and then, and then people started criticizing us, some, some people. And they would say, well, why you bother, you know, struggling around universities? These people are privileged, you know, these are, and uh, why, you know, there are many other struggles that are more important. And we said, okay, first of all, we are teachers, but, but secondly, we don't think any if that uh, the university have a very strategic place, have a very important place. And uh, the idea that you give up, you know, a place where there is a production of knowledge, etc., it's it's absurd. And many still actually, the early 80s was a time in which the Nigerian campuses were becoming more democratized, in the sense that for the first time you had the students coming from peasant background. You had students coming from families who didn't have much money, actually. And, and this is the moment when, in fact, they begin to you know, uh, impose fees and, and many, many other things. Because what be, what, that's a whole story in itself. We could talk hours what happened to those universities you know, who were told, you either find, the departments were told, you either find your own money to go on or you go under. And so, you know, the department started scrambling to find ways to get some money, you know, uh, connecting with NGO outside of the country, you know, connecting with all kinds of, anyway. Um, so we insisted that no, the university are a place of struggle. And uh, it's not true <laughs> that uh, there's a tremendous investment that is made in this building, in the, in the personal the works. There's a tremendous investment. There's a tremendous wealth. Where that wealth that goes into the university come from? This is wealth that come from people. This is wealth that come from people that worked and worked and worked. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's another place where we reclaim and struggle to decide how knowledge production, who has access to knowledge production. What is the knowledge production for? No, so that's very important. Hola, Silvia. <laughs> ¿Cómo estás? Yes. Sí, sí. sí. Um, quería preguntarles a las dos. I wanted to ask both of you. Um, how are you connecting in this era of climate crisis? How are you connecting care, politics of care, social reproduction with nature? and what's going on uh, in terms of climate crisis. In other words, how are you environmentalizing your feminisms? Mm. Well, <laughs> I have, 
my my environmentalizing is uh, very limited you know my neighbors are always uh, cutting their their whatever flowers they have because they have to change it every hour and i bring them home and i put them in a pot that's my the range here in new york of my <laughs> of my <laughs> contribution but more no I, I very to me family struggle today a large part of it is struggle of women who are in fact struggling around the land and this is one of the things i've been talking about writing about pushing for the land is fundamental the issue of land and when i mean land we don't mean just the soil but we mean trees forests animals seas rivers the issue of land is fundamental to every form of reproduction and every form of wealth. Without the land, we die. And uh, I'm very anguished by the fact that I think that there is a push. I really see this push, this corporate push, to corral us you know, all into cities. The United Nations plan for uh, 2030, I think, has this really, you know, bright idea of a world where everybody is urbanized. To me, that's a nightmare. A world where everybody is urbanized is a world where we have no control, you know, on how, you know, the natural world, natural resources are used and, uh, and where our relationship with nature, you know, is even more reduced and commercialized. So to me, the issue of the relationship to the land in all that it means um, is central to the question of reproduction. And this, I think, is one of the big changes that have taken place in feminist thinking, feminist perspective, feminist struggle from the 70s through ecofeminism, through feminism spreading in all areas where people were losing the land, where people were losing the forest, right? And so begin to see that connection, particularly strong in parts of the world where domestic labor began in the mill path, you know, began by putting some, some seeds into the ground, which then goes into your pot, which then goes into your food. So you have a control in what you're eating. And now imagine a world of everybody urbanized. There's nothing you control. Huh? And also you lose the immense wealth. You know, that uh, it's, it's, it's what makes life worth living. A world that without relationship with nature is not a world <laughs> worth living. <laughs> La vida digna. Si. De ser vivida. <laughs> si. Maybe just to, to add, I think that you know that, well, I think the, the, the main vocabulary and experience in Latin America that connects feminism and uh, ecology is about anti-extractivist struggles. Yeah. And I think it's a very powerful um, dimension to uh, connect these um, struggles, these uh, also debates. Uh, with a common vocabulary, I insist. But also, I think that after the pandemic, this is more uh, urgent, and we are s witnessing how the um, anti-extractivist debates and initiatives are more and more popular. I think that maybe 10 or 15 years ago, there is no so much uh, debate about this. Uh, issues as we have today. And I think that this is also uh, a question of the way uh, of how the feminist struggles um, build this sort of connections between, for example, food sovereignty yeah. uh, and uh, the question of land, but also the relationship between the urban, the suburban, and the peasant um, struggles. And, and I think that it's very interesting how this connection between exploitation of work mm -hmm. and uh, extraction of wealth 
and the privatization yeah. of land is yeah. now all connected. Yeah. And, and, and also how, yeah, you know, like th the women of the Meste, the landless movement, you know, was saying also at the same time, the other way around, that uh, they, when they began their struggle for land occupations, not most of them were not feminists. But then slowly they became feminists because they realized that in order to be able to carry on the struggle as they thought should be, should be carried on, they had to get rid of the patriarchal thinking of a lot of their comrades, you know? And they realized that in order to defend the land, they had to become feminists, you know? <laughs> because, yeah, the, 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 the way they, they thought the struggle should take place, yeah. And also, I think that now the, the relationship between uh, struggles about land and struggles about housing, for example, yeah. against real estate speculation, is a very yeah. strong also very, link. Very, very strong, yeah. Okay. And also, and this is really also in Yuna Mina, women like Veronica who have been writing about it, now, you know, taking the concept of extractivism, as, as you have done, and applying it to financial extractivism, to speak of the debt and the debt economy as a form of, of extractivism, because it's really sucking up from people, you know, what they have, the same way they're sucking away from the land. So actually taking words from the ecological struggle, right, yeah. Or the idea of sacrifice zones, right, that we live in a world of sacrifice zones not only those areas that are designated as sacrifice, which are sacrifice populations. Because those sacrifice zones, I was in Chile, I was supposed to visit one, and, but they're full of people. There's the idea that the sacrifice zones are, are actually the desert, but they are not, they're actually full of people. Just the, the last thing I was uh, remembering yeah. about Chile, esto lo voy a decir en castellano. Sí. Eh, cuando las compañeras eh, hablaron del feminicidio de Macarena Valdés como feminicidio empresarial, ¿no? para dar sí. cuenta de que eran las mineras las que estaban siendo parte de esa violencia sí. eh, feminicida. Entonces, creo que ese tipo de conexiones sí, también, sí. En, en la manera sí. de caracterizar un feminicidio, muestra este sí. vínculo tan estrecho. Sí, and the other thing is that when they go and they say to the state, tú eres el violador, ¿no? Can, uh, the, the, this consciousness that you don't even have the individual violence, individual, unless there is a sense of impunity, unless in a way there is something that is communicated from above. And so the, in, in all cases of violence, in a way, you know, it's the state who has the, and so the women going out. And, and I was impressed how the slogan no, circulated immediately. Three days later, in Mexico, the women were using it. And then in Italy, women were using it, yeah? The, the, you are the, yeah, tu es el violador, si. Sí. Thank you so much, Veronica and Sylvia. Thank you, everyone, for being here.